Most of us have had acne at one point in our lives, either as teens or adults. This week on Being Well, dermatologist Doug Leone from the Dermatology and Mohs Surgery Institute will be in the studio to talk about this problem that affects so many. We'll learn more about common myths related to acne, how to treat it at home, and what types of prescription medications are available. We've got that and more next on Being Well, so don't go away. Production of Being Well is made possible in part by Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Additional funding by Jazzercise of Charleston. Welcome to this week's edition of Being Well. I'm your host, Lori Casey, and today we're talking about acne with dermatologist Dr. Doug Leone. Thank you so much for coming back to Being Well. Thanks a lot for having me again. Oh, I appreciate it. acne. I had it as a teenager. Did you have it as a teenager? We all had it. Yeah, yeah. We all, <laughs> I had more of adult acne, but uh, yeah. It, no. It's something that affects a lot of people, and it's really hard as a teenager to have your skin breakout. It is. It All is, right. Yeah. So tell me first, well, what is acne and what causes it? We'll talk about it in, we'll start with the teenage acne first. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so acne, you basically need a few different things. Um, the main thing is hormones. Okay. <laughs> That's why, you know, t we don't have a lot of acne when we're eight, nine, 10. Um, and then when we hit the early teenage years, it starts to come. So, so what happens is, is um, hormone production goes up. Mm -hmm. uh, when hormone production goes up, uh, oil production goes up. Okay. Um, and when that happens, uh, it makes the cells in our skin a little bit sticky and so what happens is we get a plugged a plugged hair follicle with those sticky cells and oil and that's the first step in forming acne and then we all have bacteria in our um, each one of our hair follicles and, and that bacteria um, eats the oil and uh, once it's blocked up with those cells dead scales cells and oil um, you get an acne mm -hmm. uh, lesion so and you have millions of of hair follicles on your face. Millions of hair follicles. <laughs> so it can happen yep. really anywhere. <laughs> yep, all over your body. So, okay, so yeah. there's different types of acne. Can you kind of tell us what those are? Sure. Um, there's comedonal acne, um, and, and that tends to be um, less of what we think of as acne. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two types of comedonal acne. There's uh, the blackheads, uh, which we all know of, and those are called open comedones. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, uh, whiteheads, which are not actually pustules, but closed comedones are skin colored bumps of acne. And often patients don't even realize it's a, a type of acne, but it is, and it's quite common, especially in teenage years. And then there's what um, is called inflammatory or nodulocystic acne, and that's kind of what you and I, uh, and, and most people think of, oh, I have acne as all these pustules mm -hmm. and stuff that we can, you know, pop and they hit, hit the mirror or whatever, but um, <laughs> th th that's what most people think of as, as acne, but there's actually three forms of, okay. of, of acne. At what age do you start seeing kids with acne? Uh, it's actually getting a little bit younger, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but usually as soon as the, the hormones start kicking in, so at uh, the, the same time um, uh, females start to hit those changes, and usually around as young as like eight to nine years of age, mm -hmm. but, but usually by uh, 11, 12, 13, um, most females have had some type of acne, and, and by the time you hit 14, 15, 16, almost uh, all, all teenagers in that age group are at least getting some level of acne. Mm -hmm. So does it run in families? It does, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, genetic uh, predisposition for acne is, is a huge thing, especially um, the, the more severe acne. So if mom or dad had severe acne, you're at much greater risk to have, uh, also have severe acne. Okay, so let's run through some really common questions that you get about yeah. acne when you have people come into your office. What's one of the most common ones? Uh, I think one of the most common ones is, is why am I getting acne? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason for that is just what we talked about. The, the hormones are, are present. They're causing the skin to produce more oils. Uh, you get, you're getting those sticky skin cells that, mm -hmm. that block the follicle, and then you have acne. Um, a lot of them want to know, like, oh, is it something I'm eating? Is it something in my diet? Is it and, chocolate and high-fat yeah, foods? Right. <laughs> is it pizza or, is you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and um, all the studies that have been done so far have not shown any correlation with uh, the food types we eat and, and acne. So um, that, that's, that's a, a thing that has not been proven. So I tell mm -hmm. most patients that it's not actually been proven uh, that it's what you're eating. It could be, but, but it, there doesn't seem to be any cause and effect relationship at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then uh, the other question uh, uh, we get a lot um, is, what can I do about my, you know, what can I do mm -hmm. about my acne at home? So. And the the 
store aisles are filled with different things that you can try. And we're going to talk about what sort of, you know, um, active ingredients we should look for. But I've got another one. Does stress make your skin break out? Oh boy, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you, you'll see a lot of people, especially college age kids, that come in, oh, it's finals time, we're really stressed out and my acne is just exploding. So uh, there's no doubt in, in my mind, at, at least, that, that stress definitely causes acne. So. Is that because hormone levels change due to stress or? You know, no one knows for sure, but that's mm -hmm. probably exactly what it is. When we get stressed out, our corticosteroid level goes up in our, in our body and corticosteroids are, are known to cause acne. So that's exactly what, what probably the, uh, the method is of, of stress-induced acne is, is the hormonal changes that are going on. Okay, so this is probably another one you get, can I pick and pop my pimples? <laughs> We've well, all done yeah, it. Yeah. Admit it. You have too. I know I have. Yeah, I it's pop a, It's I, a temptation. Have you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's impossible when you see a pimple sitting there. You know, know. it's just, it's, it's begging to be popped mm -hmm. and it's hard not to. And, and, and the answer is, is you should try not to because when you do squeeze and pop that pimple, um, if it pops inward um, or doesn't, you know, sometimes we try to pop that pimple and, oh, it, it really got sore. It felt like it popped, but nothing came out. Mm -hmm. What would happen is it actually popped inwards. And that, what's, that's what the big cause of scarring with acne is. Okay. Uh, and, and so you really want to try to stay away from that as much as you can. Okay, so sometimes some people get um, maybe like it's a real hard bump, usually along the jawline mm -hmm. that is hard and large, but nothing comes out of it. What What's that? That's just a deeper form of acne. Mm -hmm. um, so that's more of the cystic type of acne we talk about, which you mm -hmm. can't pop, I mean, even if you try, because it's just so deep and it's uh -huh. painful and sore. And those eventually, as we know, they, they usually go away on their own. Mm -hmm. so, some do turn into permanent cysts, especially if we try to pop them. So that's okay. another reason not to try to uh, pick or, or fiddle with that, uh, that deeper cystic acne, because mm -hmm. it can turn into a long-term cyst. So. Okay, so let's talk about just, um, you know, what sort of if you you start you've got you've got a kid that's got acne you go to the drugstore and you get some over the counter things what are the most effective ingredients in, di in these different products that are effective for acne treatment? Yeah, there, there's a lot of over-the-counter products and it's important to know which ones are, are really gonna give you a bang for the buck and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. um, the, the number one thing you can use over-the-counter is something with benzoyl peroxide in there mm -hmm. uh, and that's the single most effective ingredient you can okay. get over-the-counter. Um, there's a lot of different washes you see out there like exploiting washes, all these hard scrubs um, that you can use and, and those are actually counterproductive and actually can okay. cause more skin irritation and acne. So I, I, I tend to stay away from those. Um, there are some salicylic acid washes, uh, a lot of good brands out there you could buy. Mm -hmm. and, and those are also somewhat effective, but, but the number one thing is, is a benzoyl peroxide uh, um, type of... And what of, does that actually do? So benzoyl peroxide is uh, antibacterial, so mm -hmm. it wipes out the, the bacteria portion of acne we talked about, and it's also anti-inflammatory. Okay. So. so why are some of those scrubs and things counterproductive? Well, they actually cause more skin irritation and, when I, and whenever your skin is irritated, it increases the chance for acne. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, those very intense scrubs and washes that, you know, a lot of people want get, to get these little uh, mitts that you put on or the, it was these exfoliating washes and they tell me how they scrape their face and, and, I, and I just cringe. I'm like, oh no, don't, don't do that. Um, it just causes a lot of irritation. It, it doesn't prevent acne a, at all. So. Okay. And can the process of using all those things over dry your face and create more oil production? Yeah, that's not been proven, but, but okay. it sure feels like that sometimes, it does. doesn't it? You know, you're, <laughs> like you dry your face out and then it kicks in the oil production. Mm -hmm. So, so, so um, I, I don't know if it does per se, there, there's really no studies out on that, but um, uh, I, I would just generally stay away from that because it's never okay. proven to work and, and you're just, you know, maybe psychologically you think it's working, but it's actually mm -hmm. causing more, more harm than good. So can acne be contagious? Like uh, you think about it, if you have a couple teenagers at home and someone right. grabs someone else's washcloth that they used to wash their face. Yeah. Is that contagious? That's a really good question. <laughs> acne itself is, has never been shown to be contagious. Um, now, um, there are lesions that look like acne, which are called folliculitis, which is an infection of hair follicles mm -hmm. with different types of bacteria um, not known to cause acne, definitely are, are contagious. So. Um, that that's a whole different type of, of, of diagnosis. <laughs> that's for but a different show. <laughs> that's for a different show. But 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 uh, yeah, acne itself is is not contagious. Okay. So um, at what point you know someone comes into your office, you have a certain treatment plan that you go through. What are what do you do to assess somebody's acne condition and and then go from there as far as recommending a you know or an over the, or over the counter or a prescription. 
Yeah, that, th and there's a lot of uh, a lot of factors that go into that decision, including what the patient's comfortable with mm -hmm. and, and how bad the acne is. Um, but basically, at a baseline, we just kind of say how bad is the acne and, and how bad uh, does the patient bother it by it, and what type of acne is it? Because mm -hmm. we talked about there being different types of acne, um, and they all require different types of treatment or a different weapon from the arsenal of treatment of acne. Mm -hmm. So, um, if someone comes in with mild acne and it's kind of that infla mild inflammatory acne, um, usually we'll start off with a topical uh, a topical cream. Um, usually something with a benzoyl peroxide and antibiotic mm -hmm. in it. Um, we sometimes may add an antibiotic early on if the patient wants to be more aggressive about it. And then over time, we'll try to get them off the antibiotic by mouth and just use the topical cream for maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, um, it depends on the, the level of acne. Um, and how bad it is and, and how aggressive the patient wants to be about uh, about it. Now, if they have that comedonal acne and it's not inflammatory, um, the topical medications uh, work much, much better than mm -hmm. a medicine by mouth for the mm -hmm. comedonal type acne. Now, I had uh, bad skin as a teenager and I took Accutane and that was many, many years ago. And is that still kind of a common uh, prescription medication for you? Acne. It is. It's very common, and, mm -hmm. and, and we use a fair amount of it. Uh, um, I myself used Accutane mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, and, and it really is a great effective treatment. Um, it's gotten a lot of bad press in the past 10 to 12 years or mm -hmm. so, which is unfortunate. Because but, uh, of the risk of birth defects. That's, that's one, one of the reasons, yeah. Something else. I can't remember what it was. The other two big things um, were that it could cause you to be depressed and, and um, sometimes suicidal, and, mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of studies out there that have shown that that, that is not a cause and effect relationship, but we still mm -hmm. want to be careful when we prescribe Accutane for mm -hmm. that because of a few incidental reports about it. Um, and there was another one saying it could cause you to have um, inflammatory bowel disease, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a, a bad situation where you, you have bloody diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually been proven in, in almost all medical studies that uh, Accutane does not cause that. But unfortunately, some of the um, some of the press got a hold with that and kind of rang with it, and, and people have this big fear of Accutane now. So what does that Accutane actually do to treat acne? How is it working? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> it works at a, a, several different steps. Um, the one step is it reduces oil production. Yes. Remember we I said. I remember very dry skin. This has been quite a few years ago, but yeah, I the lips, that. Yeah, the lips get really dry. And, <laughs> uh -huh. um, but, and that's a temporary thing when you're on the medicine. But remember we talked about acne. We said oil production, sticky cells, and bacteria mm -hmm. are the three things you need for acne. And so acne works by reducing oil production, and it does that somewhat permanently. Um, not so much that we get dry skin, but reduces it to be a more normal level of oil production. And two, it changes our cells permanently so they no longer are sticky. Um, mm -hmm. and, and won't plug those, plug those pores and follicles. So is there a certain amount of time that people are on something like that? Yeah, that's the other thing that, that um, uh, the other advantage of Accutane is you're on it for a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on your weight. Um, so it's anywhere from uh, five to seven months of, mm -hmm. of treatment course, uh, and, and then you're usually done with the, the and course. And can the acne come back? It definitely can come back. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, acne, as we all know, can be tough to treat. But 85% mm -hmm. um, of the people that, uh, that complete a course of Accutane have a long-term, uh, I don't want to say cure, but a, a very good long-term, almost remission mm -hmm. uh, of acne where it's not nearly as severe as it once was. And I mean, I myself was almost completely, um, uh, completely cured of my acne. I, mm -hmm. I rarely get it anymore. So, so let's, let's just step back a little bit. I'm thinking about a mom out there watching with a teenage boy right. or teenage girl. Just, we'll, we'll pick on the boys a little bit. Yeah. How important important is it to get your kids used to, if they've got acne, they've got that problem, get them into that habit of washing their face. Is that critical to sort of prevent or, you know, helping the acne, yeah. you know, with something yeah. to be washing it every day? Almost, almost everyone uh, that comes in talks about washing their face. Like, you know, I wash my face twice a day. You know, do, am I using the right stuff? And, and um, most people have pretty good hygiene, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you're washing once or twice a day with a gentle cleanser, um, you're doing good. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that's, that's, that's the number one thing with washing. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, and then what, what did you ask me specifically so about it? So should they, how do you get them into, the, or is it is essential, you can't, it will, it may not get rid of the acne, but if you have a teenager that just never washes their face, like with a, you know, a facial kind of cleanser. Right. Um, well, as long as you want it get worse. Yes, it will. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you have to wash your face. You have to have right. good hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, the best time to wash are morning and then any after any mm -hmm. big physical activity and before you go to bed. Yeah. So those are the big times you okay. want to wash. I'm thinking so. of like, you know, if you got kids that play football and they're wearing those football helmets, does that 
Can all that sweat and all that stuff of a football helmet create more acne? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The, uh, the sweat can, and, and even more so is anything that's rubbing on your face. When okay. we talked about those scrubbing cleansers, anything that irritates your skin like repetitive friction can cause acne. Okay. So you should wash your face if you could right before those activities and, and, and right after. Okay, so we've kind of focused on the teenagers. Now let's talk about adult acne. Um, it's not a fun thing to have, to have a breakout, you know, when you're 35 or 40 years old. Why does it still keep occurring in adults? You know, that's another thing that the, the, the incidence of adult acne seems to be on the rise, and, and no one's really sure mm -hmm. um, if it truly is on the rise or if more people are just seeking treatment for it. Okay. Um, but again, we still have the hormones. I mean, the reason it's worse when we're teenagers is because the hormones are really uh, surging, but we mm -hmm. still have those hormones in, until um, when females hit, hit postmenopausal mm -hmm. time. But um, that's why you're still getting acne. You still have all the things that cause acne. You still have the hormones, the oil production, and, and we always have a little bit of that bacteria on our skin. So. Do you see adult acne more in women than in men? It seems so, um, and, and I don't know if that's because more women are concerned about it and seek treatment, or or if it's that they just truly have a higher incidence of adult mm -hmm. acne. I feel like it's the latter. I feel like there is a little bit more a higher, higher incidence of, of adult acne in females than, than males. So is it actually a different kind of acne than teenage acne? Uh, a little bit. Uh, for, for adults, you have to make sure that acne is not caused by any medication mm -hmm. that they're taking because some medications can cause acne. Um, let, me, let me interrupt you. What medications would cause your skin to break uh, out? Usually medications, uh, well, there, there's, a, there's quite a big slew of them, but mm -hmm. the, some of the worst ones are medicines for um, bipolar disorders mm -hmm. and uh, other psychologic disorders tend to, be, okay. tend to be the biggest ones. And then some vitamins, can uh, overdosing of vitamins, especially the, B, the B12, B6, Sixes can cause uh, um, uh, some acne. So, okay. so I, I will let you finish. What is the difference between teenage acne and adult? Well, other than adult acne being harder to treat sometimes, <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it's still caused by the same things, but we tend, especially in f adult females, tend to have a lot more success with hormonal uh, treatment, mm -hmm. such as oral contraceptive pills. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also other pills out there that can block some of the hormones in, in females that are causing, uh, causing the acne. So uh, Accutane, for instance, tends to be a lot less effective in, in adult acne than it was in, in teenage acne. Okay. Um, so it tends to be more hormonally driven uh, than, than the bacteria and the sticky cell type of theory um, with the, the younger type of acne. So. Okay. So what kind of, if, if someone now as an adult had acne as a teenager and they've got those scars on their face, what kind of treatments are available to, to get rid of those acne scars? Yeah, that's a good question, and, and um, th those are really tough to treat. As we know, those are kind of deeper pockmarked mm -hmm. scars, uh, and the treatments out there that are available right now are, are cosmetic laser resurfacing, and there are several different types of lasers. You usually need uh, several different courses or rounds of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, there's deeper chemical peels uh, that can do a good job. Those usually need several, uh, several rounds of, of treatment again. Um, there's a newer treatment out there now called the Derma Pen, which is actually a fine pen that goes around. It has a lot of small needles in it. It will puncture the skin. Um, and, and several treatments of those usually uh, have been shown to be pretty that effective. That sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> well, you, you, there's some anesthesia involved okay. with all, the, uh, all those treatments, um, whether it be the, the chemical peels or the laser or the dermapen, um, almost all of them have to have some type of anesthesia involved because mm -hmm. if you want to get to the level of skin to get effective treatment, there's going to be some pain involved, so you, ha you have to use some anesthesia to reduce that. So on a lesser level, of course, the you know, the market is flooded now with skin brighteners, skin lighteners, things to diminish spots. Mm -hmm. um, do they work? Are they effective? Some are, uh -huh. and, and when people talk about acne scarring or acne marks, it's, it, I mean, I think the main question is, are we talking about the little dark spots we get yeah. after we have a lesion, mm -hmm. or are we talking about a true scar? Mm -hmm. um, those dark spots will always fade uh, on their own, uh, will almost always fade on their own mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, and there's the, the most over-the-counter brightening uh, medicines do not work, um, mm -hmm. and it goes the same for scarring. None of that over, you know, you're kind of wasting your money, in mm -hmm. my opinion, if you're using the over-the-counter treatment. So. Well, and what I've noticed with the skin lighter, you have to keep using it. <laughs> you have to keep using it, yep, yep. There are prescription strength mm -hmm. uh, uh, skin lighteners and, and some other skin lighteners that are sold mm -hmm. in physicians' offices that have been shown to be very effective, but most of the over-the-counter stuff is, is not all, all that effective. Well, and I think I noticed too, like the older, you know, if you have a pimple or something as an older adult, it takes a long time for that to go away Yeah. versus when you were a teenager. Is that just because of our age and our cells don't That's That's because of our, that, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. And anytime, uh, uh, as we get older and the older we get, our skin just doesn't heal as well mm -hmm. as it once was. I mean, if, you, if, if uh, an infant gets injured or gets their skin gets cut, and, and you know, often in s six weeks you can't even see where that lesion was, mm -hmm. an adult it might still be healing. So mm -hmm. it just it's all about uh, us getting older. 
So. so as we wrap up here, I just want to ask you a little bit about a dermatologist um, because there's a, you know, you see there's a lot of places where you can go for different facial treatments and lasering and stuff like that. Um, what, at what point should someone seek a dermatologist if they want to have some of those more advanced treatments? taken care of or well, what's your recommendation? Uh, I'd recommend that you see a dermatologist anytime you're having a, any thoughts of having any type of those advanced treatments mm -hmm. um, performed and, and not because they need to be performed by a dermatologist per se um, but just because no one knows skin better than a dermatologist right. and, and they can give you a really good opinion um, and really good information of what type of treatment is going to be the most effective, mm -hmm. w what you want to save money on and, and prevent a lot of the long-term side or at least discuss how to uh, reduce the risk of some of the long-term side effects mm -hmm. with some of those treatments um, and, and I think it's good to sometimes get a few different opinions uh, about what those what those treatment regimens are because some people have propensity to kind of push whatever they offer um, and I think getting two or three different opinions is well worth it mm -hmm. uh, and it may cost you a little more upfront to get those opinions but in the long run if you're going to spend the money for that cosmetic improvement um, I think it's, it's it's a pretty good investment well, so. and it is it's your I mean most of those things are taking place on your face so it's That's right. in an area that you really can't cover up if something goes wrong. Exactly. It's, it's hard to go backwards, you know. <laughs> and um, and the, the other thing I tell people you asked about the acne scarring is the single best treatment for that is to prevent the acne to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and, and I get a lot of moms coming in with their kids with really bad acne saying, oh, geez, you know, um, we've done the antibiotics, nothing's working. I don't want to use the Accutane um, because I've heard these bad things about it. And, and what I try to tell them is, you know, this scarring is permanent mm -hmm. and, and, and your child has to live with that for their whole life on their face. So, so that's, that's a pretty big part of your health, too. So, so the, the number one thing with, with acne and acne scarring is get it treated quickly and effectively and, and prevent it from happening in the first place. Because it usually just doesn't go away. I mean, it, as a teenager, it just doesn't magically disappear. I mean, you can kind of outgrow it a little bit, can't you? Yeah, it, usually as we get older, acne gets a lot less intense. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I see is a lot of patients coming in um, after they've had really bad acne for like two or three years, and they've tried all this over-the-counter stuff, and now they have really, really bad scarring. So mm -hmm. the idea is get, get it treated early. Don't wait. Don't, don't be, th you know, when, you're, when your kid's 14, 15, 16, 17, don't be thinking, oh, maybe next year it'll get better because by next year it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to get that stuff treated early. Well, and it's a it's a self esteem thing too. I mean, it's really hard to be a teenager and have all these you know pimples on your face. It's, it can be really devastating. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one self perception is probably one of the most important parts of our of our mental health and overall health. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, getting that treated effectively early on um, is just an amazing an amazing improvement in one's overall health, not just their not just their acne. Yeah. I mean, so. I remember I had bad skin as a teenager, and boy, when it cleared up, it was like. Uh, the world changed for me so yeah you, you, you really I mean I think you really feel like a new person and mm -hmm. it puts an extra bounce in your step you have a new outlook on life and, yeah. and yeah. it's good to get treated early so all right well Dr. Leone thanks for coming by being well and talking about acne with us yeah thanks again for having me appreciate it Runny nose, sore throat, cough, and a fever. Those symptoms are typical of cold and flu season. Most of the time, kids who catch a virus get better on their own with the help of some TLC. But how do parents know when it's time to take them to the doctor? Here's advice from a pediatric emergency physician at Mayo Clinic. Little Sarah and her sister Maggie are in the ED because of persistent cold and flu symptoms. Runny nose, sore throat, and a fever. Fevers are usually designated as temperatures greater than 100.4. Hi, Sarah. I'm Dr. Hami. Dr. Jim Hami sees many kids come into the ED because of fever. But he says these days, with most kids having been vaccinated against many common and dangerous illnesses, the height of the fever doesn't always correspond to the severity of illness. For the majority of children, parents should never use the fever as the sole indication to bring them into the doctor. For example, he says he's more concerned about a listless child with a low temp than a more normal acting one with a higher temp. So it's really important for a parent to look at their child and assess how they're acting and interacting with them compared to what they normally are like and make decisions based on that and not so much based on the fever. Look for other symptoms such as difficulty breathing, very poor fluid intake, severe pain, vomiting, or if your child is listless or not responsive. And it's important to be extra vigilant with newborns. Any temperature over 100.4 
in that infant less than two months, sometimes three months if they haven't had their vaccines yet, is going to be a, a trigger for you to bring them in. Dr. Hami says you should also bring in your child if symptoms suddenly get worse or if a fever goes away and then comes back, as that could be a sign of a secondary infection such as pneumonia, which may require treatment with antibiotics. Most kids do get better on their own, so the key is to help relieve symptoms. So you can treat your child with appropriate doses of either ibuprofen or acetaminophen. If your child is not up to date on vaccinations or has health problems such as being immune compromised, do see a doctor if fever is present. For Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Vivian Williams. When's the last time you got a good night's sleep when on the road? For many, traveling can make it tough to get the seven or eight hours of sleep we need each night. Reporter Holly Furfer gives us tips on how to get your Z's when you're away from home. When people travel a lot, it can be hard to get a good night's sleep. Sherry Torcos is a pharmacist and author who's written on diets, travel, and lifestyle. You're changing time zones, you're eating at different times, maybe you're sleeping in a hotel room, listening to noise, you have lights. And these things can disrupt our sleep cycles, making rest hard to come by. But there are things frequent travelers, as well as stay-at-homers, can do to help. First off, experts say, avoid caffeine late in the day. Also, don't eat a big meal right before you go to sleep because all of your body's processes are going to go towards digestion. You're not going to feel calm and relaxed and you could have a bit of a belly ache and that may affect your ability to fall asleep. If you're hungry before bed, grab a light snack with a little bit of protein and complex whole grains. And don't use alcohol as a sleep aid. Alcohol may help you to fall asleep, but if you have alcohol, it can actually cause nighttime wakening. If you can't sleep, Torco says, to try to avoid the distracting devices we carry around. So don't check cell phone messages or go online to work. This can amp you up. And if you turn on the TV, watch something that's relaxing or try meditating. For today's Health Minute, I'm Holly Furfer. Production of Being Well is made possible in part by... Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System, supporting healthy lifestyles, eating a heart-healthy diet, staying active, managing stress, and regular checkups are ways of reducing your health risks. Proper health is important to all at Sarah Bush Lincoln Health System. Information available at sarahbush.org. Additional funding by Jazzercise of Charleston.